Good morning. <laughs> Dare to imagine curing cancer. What I'm going to talk about today is a story of imagination, of perseverance, and really a scientific revolution that spans more than 100 years. And I'll start with a quote. Nature often gives us hints to her profoundest secrets. As a scientist, I know this to be true. I live this, I see this every day. And what I hope to do is convince you that this is true, and really how nature, through her secrets, is helping us really imagine a day in which we all finally cure this disease which has touched so many of us for so long for good. This quote is by Dr. William Coley from 1891. You'll hear more about him in a little bit. So some of you might have seen this, Keytruda. This is a new type of cancer drug. It's been getting a lot of attention. It's been a lot of ads on television, magazines, and the internet. You might have seen, if you've been paying attention closely, ads for this drug. It's a similar type of cancer drug. Different manufacturer, different name, same general class. And you might be familiar with this story. This is former President Jimmy Carter a couple years ago, speaking here at Notre Dame at Father Ted's memorial. What you might know is just a couple years before that, at the age of 91, Jimmy Carter was successfully treated for stage four melanoma that had spread to his brain. He's treated with these new kinds of drugs. And he'll be here in this area in August, helping to build houses for Habitat for Humanity. And if you've been paying really close attention, just recently approved by the FDA, are two whole new types of drugs. Not even drugs, really new types of cancer therapies. All of these belong to a new class, a new way to treat cancer called immunotherapy. And what I'm gonna tell you is a little bit about where this comes from, how these things work, and again, how they're giving us hope to finally curing cancer once and for all. So the story begins with this guy, Dr. William Coley. You saw his quote earlier. Dr. Coley was a physician around the turn of the 20th century in New York City. And um, he was a surgeon. He treated cancer patients. Really, in the 1890s, the treatment for cancer was to cut. And that's what Dr. Coley did. And one of his patients was this young woman, Betsy DeShiel. She had bone cancer. And Dr. Coley operated on her, later amputating her arm. But her cancer had spread, and she died at the age of 18 from metastatic bone cancer. And Dr. Coley was profoundly affected by her death, and he thought there had to be another way. There had to be a better way. So he started combing hospital records. He talked to other physicians. He talked to patients, former patients. And he stumbled upon this connection. So this is the 1890s. Sometimes after surgery, many times after surgery, patients would come down with terrible infections. There were no antibiotics. And every now and then, after surviving an infection, a cancer patient would have seen their cancer disappear. And so he hypothesized that maybe there was some kind of connection between whatever was happening during or after an infection, and cancer disappearing. And he thought of ways he might test this idea. Now, to be fair to a lot of other people, this was not an altogether new idea. This has been observed before. And in fact, the earliest recording observation of a connection between infection and cancer dates back to this guy, Imhotep, uh, one of the first recorded physicians of all time, physician uh, in ancient Egypt almost 5,000 years ago. And from the writings that are survived, we know that uh, his treatment for what he didn't know, but we know were tumors, were to cut them open, stick them full of goo, which would lead to an infection, and every now and then the patient would survive. Imhotep later gets promoted for being a court physician to being the Egyptian god of medicine. All right. So Dr. Coley thinks of ways to, to take advantage of this or, discuss, or, or explore it, see if he can in, in, make a connection between bacterial infections and curing cancer. And his first patient is this fellow. He's really only known to us by his last name, Mr. Zola. Zola was a homeless man in New York City. He had a terrible case of head and neck cancer, as you can see here. Uh, story is that he could barely eat. And he was really only given a few weeks to live when Dr. Coley started treating him. And what he did was, well, relatively simple and very dangerous. He injected his tumor with a bunch of staph bacteria bacteria that kills people. Um, and Dr. S uh, or Zola gets very sick. And Dr. Coley treats him several times over a, a period of a week or two. 
Um, he gets very sick, fever spikes. But according to Dr. Coley's writings, his tumor melts away. Zola goes on to live another nine years until his cancer comes back and he later dies from it. So Dr. Coley keeps working on this, and he does more experiments and treats other people. He moves from using live bacteria, which cause terrible infections, to using dead bacteria, which do some other things, inflammation and, and um, some other reactions. And he gets a lot of press. Here's a clipping from the New York Times in 1908, where the story is that he had successfully cured over 100 people using what he was now calling Coley's toxins. And he was going around and marketing this as a potential cure for cancer. Now, other things are at work here. Medicine is moving forward in the early 1900s. Surgery is improving. Chemotherapy comes along. Radiation becomes a way to treat cancer. And this connection between what, whatever was happening with infections, live or later dead bacteria, and, and cancer disappearing kind of falls out of the mainstream, except in the mind of this woman, Helen Coley Knotts. This is Dr. Coley's daughter. And she really makes it her life mission to understand and further this research, really she believes that what was happening, which we now call immunotherapy, has the ability to cure all types of cancers. And in the 1950s, with the help of the Rockefeller family, she founds in New York City the Cancer Research Institute, which is a research and philanthropic org organization which furthers and supports research into this connection between our immune systems and cancer. So what do we know now that we didn't know 100 years ago? Well, we know that infections stimulate the immune system. And we know that our immune system protects against and fights disease. But what we really know, that we didn't know then, was that our immune systems defend us not, against, not just against viruses and pathogens and other sorts of things, but also cancer. And in fact, there's a back and forth between our immune systems and cancer and all of us. Every single one of us over the course of our lifetimes will develop early stage tumors or early stage cancer cells that our immune systems kill off. We never know about it. And it's not until something happens where these early stage cancer cells get the upper hand over the immune system and develop into a full-fledged tumor. So what happens? How does this work? How does the immune system do this? So here's a healthy cell. Now something can happen in a healthy cell. It transforms and becomes a disease cell. Now outside, on the surface of this cancerous cell, are little markers that say, hey, something's wrong. And this cell can be encountered by a special cell of the immune system called a T cell. And it's the job of the T cell to sense if something is wrong. And if it does, some magic happens, and the T cell kills a cancer cell. And then this T cell goes off and divides and does other things to propagate an immune response. So this is how our immune systems kill off virally infected cells, and this is one way our immune systems kill off cancer cells. But the cool thing is this whole process is enhanced when the immune system is boosted. And that's exactly what Coley's toxins were doing, boosting the immune system in these patients, helping the immune system do what it was not really able to do in those full-fledged tumors. Here's an image of this process happening more realistically. This is in the middle, you see a tumor cell being surrounded by and killed by killer T cells of the immune system. So how does this relate to these new drugs and the story with Jimmy Carter? So in a developed tumor, and one that's escaped destruction by the immune system, what they do is they learn how to put T cells asleep. They pump out little molecules and say, hey, chill out, just relax, nothing to see here. These are not the droids you're looking for, right? So what these drugs do, is they block that process. They wake up the T cells and allow them to do their job. Now these drugs, for many people, are game changers, literally life savers, but they don't work for everybody. There's more research to be done. But they really highlight the power of the immune system in treating cancer or curing cancer, which leads us to these new kinds of drugs. Actually, as I said before, these are not drugs at all. These are a whole new type, a whole new way to treat cancer called cell therapy. So how do they work? Well, here's this process I showed you before. One of the key things in this process is in this little green oval. This is the interaction between a sensor protein, a special sensor protein on the T cell, and a target protein on the cancer cell. And what we now know how to do with molecular engineering, biochemistry, is go into these sensor proteins and really atom by atom tweak them and improve them to make them more sensitive, more effective, 
and more potent. And what we can do is take those enhanced sensor proteins, put them into T cells, and make more sensitive, more effective, and more potent T cells. So this is how cell therapy works. Here's a patient, a cancer patient. What we can do is take out the T cells, or some T cells from that patient, engineer them with these enhanced sensor proteins, go into their DNA, put the DNA for these better proteins in there, and really make super T cells. We can take those T cells, put them back into a patient, really, and allow these enhanced super T cells to, de to deliver a better, stronger, more potent immune response. So what we're doing really is giving cancer patients genetically engineered supercharged immune systems for targeting cancer. Right, now that's just cool. Right? I don't know what your definition of cool is, but it's got to include this. Now, um, so I'm pushing 50 here. When I was a kid, I was promised a flying car. Right? It's 2018, not a flying car. I was promised a jetpack. Right? Here's the flying car I was promised. I was I, in fact, I was promised a flying car and a jetpack. I don't have either one of them. I bet nobody here has a flying car. But there are people who are alive today who have received, who, only because they have received, and people who are right now receiving genetically engineered immune systems for targeting their cancer. And that's cool. I'll take that over a jetpack or a flying car any day. So let me finish up with one more thing. So I showed you this, this picture here, this, this connection between immune systems and cancer. Most of us don't, have, don't think about the immune system this way. This is getting out there, so we're, we're more people are becoming aware of this. But most of us, when we think about the immune system, think about vaccines. Vaccines are one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century. They're responsible for saving countless lives. Think of smallpox, polio. And so the question is, can we, because of this connection between the immune system and cancer, can, can we come up with vaccines for cancer? And the answer is yes. Not today, but this research is happening. In 10, 15 years, we'll be doing this, and here's how. One of the key things out on the surface of these disease cells, in addition to these target proteins, are these little red shapes. And these are called tumor antigens. And what we can do now is go into the DNA, the genome of a tumor cell, find all the little things that are wrong, these are the tumor antigens, and use those as the basis for a patient-specific cancer vaccine. Again, this is going to happen. This research is happening now. In 10, 15 years, we'll be doing this. We'll be making vaccines first to treat cancer and eventually to prevent cancer based on the immune system. So I'll finish up here, just to remind you, the story really began in the modern era anyway with Dr. William Coley. And it was because of him, some former Nobel Prize winners, future Nobel Prize winners, his daughter, thousands of scientists, researchers, clinicians, students, some of them here at Notre Dame, that have had the imagination, the perseverance, to really drive this story that allows us to dare to imagine curing cancer. Thank you.